Good evening, and welcome to the Library of Virginia. My name is Tanika Hobbs, and I'm the Program and Education Coordinator here, and it is my great pleasure to um, be able to present this program to you, Virginia in First. Uh, and it's not very often that an opportunity like this comes along when we uh, have the ability not to promote only one, but two poets. And, um, and they've been incredibly uh, agreeable, um, both Michelle Bussois and John Cassine, in agreeing to do this program collaboratively. And, and not only that, but to do it in a workshop, a workshop fashion, so that we can really talk about their influences, of course, uh, one of which is Virginia. Before I bring them up and uh, they're introduced to you, I did want to take the opportunity to let you know about some other programs that we have going on here at the Library of Virginia. If you spend any time in our lobby, it's probably impossible to miss the big red board with the big purple bird. Uh, we are housing a show here uh, on the life of Edgar Allan Poe, Pant Poe Man at the Monster, that will be on display until December of this year. If you have not taken a, a gander through the gallery, I invite you to do so. Uh, in connection with that exhibition, on Wednesday, October the 14th, we'll be having and not only a lecture, um, but a lecture followed by a bus tour. Greg Kimball, who is the Director of Education and Outreach, will give, be given a lecture, uh, a talk on the tale of three cities, Poe and Richmond, um, really discussing the three times that Poe returns to the city and, and the differences and uh, the changes that took place in this very place uh, over the 40 years of his life. And that's going to be followed by a Poe revealed bus tour that's going to be led by Richmond Discoveries. Uh, there is a fee associated with that, but if you're interested, there is more information. We have um, out at the table uh, sheets with a complete listing front and back, taking you through December of all the incredible programs that we have going on here at the Library of Virginia. So please take advantage. With that, I'd like to bring up uh, Mr. Ron Carey, who is the Vice President of Targeted Solutions at the Richmond Times-Dispatch, who has been a wonderful partner for us here at the Library of Virginia, and he will do us the great honor of introducing our poets for this evening. Ron? Thank you. of the Richmond Times-Dispatch. Um, as as uh, Tamika said, I'm Ron Carey, Vice President for Targeted Solutions at the Richmond Times-Dispatch. Glad that each of you could join us today for a book talk with authors Michelle Bossois and John Castine. This particular book talk, this particular book talk is special for two reasons. First, you will be hearing from two authors versus one. And second, this talk is part of the Edgar Allan Poe talk series, which highlights the library's wonderful pop art exhibit on Poe that I hope each of you will visit following the lecture. Michelle is professor of English at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. She also serves as associate editor of BKMK Press. She is the author of three books of poetry, No Private Life, Understory, winner of the Samuel French Morse Prize, and Trembling Air, a Penn USA finalist. She is co-author of the popular book, Writing Poems, now in its seventh, seventh edition. Her latest work, and the one you will hear more about today, A Sunday in God's Years, is centered on the long poem, A Reckoning. Made up of 15 shorter poems, sections that present the stories of a poet who reckons with her slave-owning ancestry. A Sunday in God Years is a fantastic book Boiseau has composed a suite of historical poems set at the intersection of personal and collective life. A book in which uh, private grief and public sorrow are different aspects of single legacy, a legacy that's both a privileged burden and a burdensome privilege. Encompassing heart-wrenching intimacy and cultural nightmare, the beauty of nature and the fragility of family bonds, A Sunday in God's Years is a flat out wonderful book, one of the best I've read in years. Alan Shapiro, author of Old War Poems. Our second feature author, John Castine, teaches at Sweetbriar College. He lives in Earliesville, Virginia, and is a graduate of Iowa, Iowa Writers Workshop. His poems have appeared in Plowshares, The Georgia Review, The Iowa Review, Shenandoah, and other journals. He has contributed prose to Slate, BQR, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. 
The points in the free union revolve around physical work, the Appalachian landscape, and family relationships. Casting for 10 years, a designer and builder of custom furniture covers subjects ranging from the farm to the shop floor, from the, cusp, from the rivers of the Piedmont to the wooded shoulders of the Blue Ridge, and from the hyper attentiveness of childhood through the, through the anxieties and joys of fatherhood. John Castine is a craftsman in his life and in his poems. Just as any good carpenter understands the wood upon which his lathe down to his of xylem and its flown, its roots, its weathered bark and leaves. Castine knows language at its most cellular level, and he makes poems that are durable and elegant. Solid not just for the construction, but for the sense of stewardship that he brings to the task of writing. D.A. Powell, author of Cocktails. Again, thank you for joining us today, and now I like, would like to welcome Michelle and John to the stage. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you very much for being here this evening. I appreciate your presence. and. Um, of course, the support of the library for poetry and poets. Thank all of you very much. Um, I want to start off by talking a bit about uh, the relationship between place and poetry for me. I think that that relationship is different for anyone who writes poetry. I don't think that anyone gets away from it. Um, and certainly some writers are simply governed by it um, in a very beneficial way for their entire careers. Um, so let me, let me introduce the poems by talking about place and then, then read some poems. I'll talk for about 20 minutes and then turn it over and uh, then we'll discuss. Yeah? Okay. Um, to begin with, I was not born in Virginia, I was born in California, which I think makes me a non-native for a lot of people who are from here. But I moved here was when I was about 18 months old, and with the exception of uh, three years when I was in high school, and two years when I was in grad school, and one year living in Maine, I've lived here my whole life. Um, when I was a small boy, I lived in a number of different small communities in Nelson County, which is between Charlottesville and Lynchburg. Um, and my earliest memories, I think it's fair to say, are of um, the landscape and the people and especially the language of that time and place. My mother was a school teacher. Um, without, I think it's fair to say, without a lot of money and uh, being a single mother in the early 70s in rural and sub-rural Virginia, I think, was no piece of cake. And I ended up in the care of um, a number of very benevolent, mostly older people, some of whom were older women in my mother's family, and some of whom were people who lived in the neighborhood who simply understood that she was somebody who was alone and had a child and a job and needed support at a time when there weren't really mechanisms of support for people in her situation. They were very kind to me. Um, people who brought me into their homes, you know, fed me at their tables. Uh, my mother and I lived for a long time on a farm in a sort of a little two or three room cinder block house next to a cattle field. And as a young kid, my life was the mountains in Nelson County and the accents of the people who lived there and the, the life that a little kid has running around with cows all day. And I feel neutral about it now, although for a long time I felt it was like, you know, a blessing from God to have this, this background this, where everything was filling in the blanks. Every, I mean, everything was, everything seemed like a blank slate. It seemed as though one could say whatever one wanted. And I had all of these people who were, you know, telling me family stories 
and feeding me the kind of food that they had eaten in that place and from that place since time immemorial. And, and for a young kid and then feeding a, a, a young man who wanted to write, it was, um, it was extraordinary. When I grew up, I lived in Charlottesville. And uh, I got to know the areas around Charlottesville pretty well, um, which is where I live now. The first poem I want to read you refers to some of those places, and the history of the place is built in. Um, so for instance, I'll give you more of the context on a poem like this than I ordinarily would, just giving a reading sort of in a vacuum where people wanted to enjoy the poems. Box Elbow Mountain, which is in the poem, is to the left, uh, to the west of Charlottesville. And on Box Elbow Mountain, there's a creek that comes down, and, and straddling the creek is a, a church that's built up on stone pilings so that the creek actually runs under the church. So when they wanted to do baptisms, they would simply open a trap door in the, uh, the nave of the church. And I, I, it seemed to me when I discovered that that was real, that it was sublime. And that, you know, how could I, how could I not talk about that? How could I not celebrate that? Um, Bucks Elbow Mountain is also the mountain uh, on which they release bears that are um, problem bears in Shenandoah National Park. So, if, you know, if it raids the dumpster too many times at Big Meadows, they stick it in a, in a trailer trap and drag it down here to Bucks Elbow where it, you know, gets in people's trash cans instead, but at least it's on private land, right? Um, there's a, a person in this store, Grover Vandevender. Grover Vandevender has been dead for a long time, and I actually never met him, but he, he ran a store across from what's now a racetrack west of Charlottesville. Um, Grover Vandevender's store is where my dad would take William Faulkner, whose research assistant he was, and saddle up his horse so that Faulkner could then ride from there back to the university when he was a writer in residence at UVA. The road along which he would ride is called Barracks Road. It's called Barracks Road because there were Hessian soldiers who were barracked there by the English before the Revolutionary War and imprisoned there by the Americans after the Revolutionary War. <laughs> Conveniently enough, the housing already existed. Uh, but that sort of thing is built into this poem. You don't, um, you don't have to know any of that, I hope, for the poem to work. But all of that is in there for me. So a lot of a lot of what I'm talking about is a personal relationship for me that imbues poetry with something about landscape, history, culture, and language. This poem is, you leave one room, you enter another. Year after year, this. First warm days, March, young shoots, the verdant palette again, and the two tracks, side hilling Bucks Elbow Mountain. It's liturgical. I drive by the church house that straddles the brook, drive by the fork where they set free those bears who nuisances make of themselves in the park. I want to say one fixates on the small, the immediately at hand, the repeatable, like the clensions of dead language verbs, like the particular blue of the chicory flowers who volunteer anew each June, saffron color of unmown ryegrass wintered over in slant light. I ride this hard by Grover Vandevender's store, where Faulkner and my father met to ride the trails from here to Barracks Stud, called Barracks for Hessians who garrison there, by this same line of cedars. Where I live now, all's freighted and never done. Here, one's best ambiguities, the senses in which one is left when one's choices are lifted away. Keep looking. Foothills lockstitch, knit and pearled, knit and pearled, this landscape like a suture laid by shaky hands. Here, I am tightly held, and new, and not healed up. You leave one room, you enter another, world without end. I could not live in books alone, or spend my life in grief. There remain, of course, those greens that collards are, the greens they aren't, the several worlds we inhabit, the more than several. We have the nevertheless, and we have the never the more. Um, that, that last tag phrase, I think, is uh, more a comment about 
this historical moment than about any of that came before. Um, I think the people in our rough historical moment, or especially in my generation, are the last to have a leg in the old world and the first to have full access to the new. And so when I think about the people in the audience, at least one of whom knows the old world very intimately, and at least six of whom know the new world because it's theirs. You know, we live, we live in a moment when we can span that kind of breadth, and I think that's historically anomalous. I don't, I don't think most people in human history have lived that way. Um, I'm going to read a poem about Southside Virginia, uh, but first, another sort of intro. Um, I think that poetry is a way into that which connects people and can't be parsed. I think that the reason people enjoy poetry is that it connect, connects them to something that can't be easily paraphrased. Um, when I think about my conception of history and the fact that it's fairly complicated, uh, a lot of that is because I spent a lot of time as a younger man um, in Alderman Library at the University of Virginia doing research on original manuscripts. So. I believe in libraries the same way that I believe in literary magazines because the, the first source material is, I think, irreplaceable. Um, the name of my book, Free Union, is the town where I live, but it's also the name of the church that's in the town. It's called Union because it was a Union church. There were four different denominations who gathered there to worship, um, Baptist, Presbyterian, Episcopal, and Methodist. And each Sunday, a different clergyman would ride in, circuit riders, you know. And the idea there was that there was more that united them spiritually than divided them liturgically. And I like that idea. Um, furthermore, it's called free. The free and free union refers to the fact that when the church was built in 1838, uh, from the moment they opened the doors, it was open to people of all races. It was a place that it seemed to share a very local, very rural uh, sort of forerunner of the progressive sensibility that I admire in Southern culture. There's a lot that I don't admire in Southern culture. I don't admire the Leonard Skinner part. I admire the R.E.M. part. Right? So, um, this is about Southside. It's along uh, 460, which goes from Suffolk to Petersburg. Um, and all of the names uh, of the places there are named after places in novels by um, Scott. Scott, Sir Walter Scott, right? So, Disputanta de Zuni. Pulp and coal, long trains, and anything grows. Drop silos rust by the southern states, and combines drip anhydrous down the rows. Black stalks of cotton gone woody, their bowls floating above like heat shimmer. We are out of the drought, we think. All's green, and the five flat fingers of the squeak gum inch over the guardrails along 460. A plasma cutter formed the press broke wheels of heavy trucks whose chromed lugs spin bright orbits by my window. We have crossed to the south side of the river, the soil a different color, alluvial, the continent divided into plots of peanut, feedlot, soy. The packing houses clear story windows over corrugated high ceilings. The building acts like a smokestack, has to draw right, and the sibilance of stock fans, of radials. Like seeing stars, that noise, but like what one hears underwater, the clicks and shrieks that bubbles make when someone kicks or we go hypoxic. Or like an exhalation, when we reach the certain strictures we find ourselves within. Again, chinoiseries the planter leaves by sticking to the contour of a field. They pass so fast, we see them in that we see only an instant of them, editing what we can't get all of, get enough of. Always in the middle of one thing, at the edge of something else, always moving on. Disputanta, Waverly, Wakefield, Ivor, Zuni. What might living here be like? Like no one does. Like I don't already. Like I'm living anyplace else. Disputanta, by the way, is the name of a town on whose name um, this railroad executive who named all the towns and his wife could not agree. So they named it Disputanta, like, we'll, we'll figure that one out later. Still Disputanta. 
That's true, too. Um, it seems to me that, that history is usually more complicated than we think. It seems to me that culture, uh, you know, every time we think we've got a handle on, for instance, what Southern culture is or what Virginia culture is, uh, we're a little wrong, and we're wrong in ways that matter. Um, one of the things that I do as a writer is to help edit the Virginia Quarterly Review, and on the door of the office of the editor of the magazine is a, a, a typed fragment of a letter from John Crow Ransom having to do with his argument with agrarians and his insistence that if being an agrarian means publishing in Virginia Quarterly Review, then he is no longer an agrarian. And the reason that the, the, reason that the, the sign is on the door, the reason that the, what's in the sign matters, is that it's the letter that founded the Southern Review. It's the letter that split the agrarians into one progressive camp, which was in, uh, in favor of what we would eventually recognize as civil rights, and another side which was reactionary or conservative, um, which had uh, another set of magazines and another set of principles that governed um, the aesthetics that came from their politics. Um, I like knowing that aesthetics or poetics and politics are linked in ways that Americans, in my experience, tend to question. I believe that they are linked. I believe that they are mutually interdependent. Um, which is why I, you know, I end up with a poem that talks about what is it to look at landscape, what is it to look at the agricultural landscape when I no longer farm, and I never will farm again. Um, when most people have moved off the farm, and yet the cultural wellspring from which uh, most of what we understand about Virginia takes root is there. It's in the land. Here's another one. This is uh, it's from a book I'm working on now. It's called Cold Snap. Um, and I mention it because it's, it, it's a poem that takes place while I'm driving from where I live to where I work. Um, driving through the, the part of the state where I grew up, where I was a little kid, as I was, as I was describing, um, and feeling intimately connected through, through personal history, but also somewhat separate from it, because I'm just another guy in a minivan on the four lane. You know? um, there's one weird piece of context that you would know if you're active on the CB radio, which is that Channel 9 is the, the channel that the state police monitor in case there's an emergency. So if you have a CV and call out on channel 9, they come running apparently. This is Cold Snap. Half done November, hop hornbeams by the rockfish, how their leaves rasp and twirl, sycamores in their high starched collars. Out here, there's no one home but wind, house lights of Lovingston syncopate along the forelane. Night drops like waxed wings off a blown poppy's sullen head. I'm day to day here, not afraid of nothing, passing the county mountain and his lullabies on Channel 9. Even low clouds haul their ass, tumbling down three ridges like they're late for a meeting. God with his thumb on the balance. I think with the, the time that I have left, um, I'm going to read some, some poems without talking much more about them. The, borrow, I, I think, from the vernacular and also speak to landscape and what it is that we have in common living in this place. Um, some of them are seasonal, but all of them are sort of located in the Piedmont foothills. Um, this is Spring Ephemerals. March, so the crocus embroiders its names along the ditch banks. Woods, brush, color field of the field. In like a lion, they say, in like a lion, the dormant season sublimating, crepuscular, hypertrophic. Inside the fence, timothy, ryegrass, it rains on six horses. Look how they drift like smoke, purposeful, directionless, enervated, and subdued. They act like they're at home, no matter wherever they are. They wend, and memory unthreads like a bobbin. One of, one of these poems' few redeeming features is their brevity. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and I, I will say that I didn't realize that, any, that, that, that these were written in a vernacular until someone said to me, when did you start writing the vernacular? Then I discovered that it was so. This is called, It Wishes Was Money. It Wishes Was Money. Bad news travels fast, ain't it? Half past lunch, Bayes scrim of the hay crop bowed low in the creek bottom. I've been down and back with all this once already. Long shadows these days, just passing through a piece of sunrise in my pocket. The good ones never announce their intentions, never ask of you just what they want. But look at what you are. Show me one more time those stobs set square in the ground. Tell me again about that good life, the power and the glory. Stobs are the, the stakes that get put in the ground before a building is erected. They're, they're what shows where the foundation should end up. Um, I live at the, the foot of the Blue Ridge Mountains. So when I look out my back door, I'm looking at them. Um, and the, the crop that's, or the, the shrub that's sort of under the canopy of trees is mountain laurel, which is a plant that I love because it only grows in horrible conditions. The worse the soil is, the better the mountain laurel does. It's bizarre. Um, it's like it was engineered for suffering. Um, so this is one for the mountain laurel. Yeah. Here's what to admire. How it thrives on adversity, accepts its condition of want and greens. Makes a limber bark, makes bright ecliptic or coronated flowers, and speaks in the vernacular register, a watershed. In downpours of verdant shelter, sheds water. Canny scantling, it's good at what it's good at. I'm trying hard to clear my head, to think without language, to remember that whole life before the adjective. Don't forget, the shadow moves more than you move, and intends less. Overhead, contrails center where jets just passed, just ice, wind blown, like seed, where stars are what belongs. I'll do is read one more. Um, I think that'll bring you out right on time. Um, I mentioned farming earlier. For a long time, I worked on a farm and loved it. Uh, I loved the work. I loved being uh, connected in that way to landscape and to the people who worked on the land. Um, I did it off and on for about 10 years, building barns and fences and planting trees and that kind of stuff. And the, the guy that I worked for is now a newspaper editor, oddly enough. He went from being a farmer to being a newspaper editor. And he uh, surprised me one day by giving me a birthday gift and explaining to me that he would only give me gifts that made me more useful to him. <laughs> um, which I appreciated. His name is Mike and he's in the poem. This is called The Gift. Beyond Mike's cattle gate, the field is nothing, the sycamore less than nothing. Pippins bend as Baptist bells carry from town a mile. Beneath the house is a crate of nails, and every nail is a perfect nail. Look at one. The dogs are learning to be careful and attentive and run circles around reason. It's fall. Some men are shooting back the bolts of the beautiful rifles. As I write, the range of variables narrows. I think the line is like the seal of the manifold to the block, the most correct when least visible. Diesel mules creep in switching yards, their lights on night and day. Mike had said his gifts to me would make me more useful to him. A tape, level, framing hammer, fence pliers, five acres in independence, lives of the poets. Cold coffee, cold comfort, the moon just past new and waxing. There's no need for challenge, nothing to break the fall of leaves as squirrels go nuts. I've spent my time standing between field and road, wishing I was drunk and waiting for something to change my life, which it won't. The dog's warm, wet, healthy nose pushes up my free hand, the hand I don't have on the chain latch. The bells ring and ring. I open the pipe gate. We populate, we punctuate the field. Thank you.
thanks for coming. I uh, did some of the research um, in this book, in this library. Um, some of the research is in, physically in the book. This is uh, some of the wills of my ancestors, willing human people to each other. When you read that, it's very unsettling. You realize you had a hand in something even though you didn't know anything about it. In the Richmond Inquirer in 1834, the cover of my book is a map of, and this is Amelia County, which is the county that's, well you guys know where Amelia County is probably. It's a county over from Chesterfield, across the river. This is the Appomattox River, where it comes through the property, and here's my family name there, where they, this is a farm they had from 1840 to 1864, 1863. I don't really know, there, was, there were five brothers. My um, great-grandfather was the oldest. He um, was shot, he was on reconnaissance with the cavalry. He was shot um, right before the battle. Cedar Creek started in October of 1864. Um, his wife was pregnant. He lived all the way until December 24, 1867. My grandfather was born in February, 1868. So he was an old man when he met my grandfather. I never knew him, he died in 1940. But he was a southerner, he was a Richmond. And even, he, he came, from, uh, came from Richmond, but they were down in Petersburg, at least his mother's family, Parham, which is, uh, big road that runs right through the parms. They lived in Petersburg, and they lived in Chesterfield County. They lived, you know, they came in 18, they left um, France in 1685, and they moved with everybody, moved from one county over and county over and county over. My uh, grandfather um, grew up in Richmond and started working for the railroad and um, came to Cincinnati in about, um, 1888, worked for the Big Four Railroad, was a freight manager. He's an old elderly gentleman. He came into my uh, the drugstore where my grandmother uh, was a pharmacist. And um, I think he was looking for a young wife. <laughs> he was going to be an old man. He wanted someone to take care of him. Um, so within this really peculiar thing, I mean, it's very peculiar for somebody who's my age, who has a great-grandfather who died in the Civil War. Somebody who's, I mean, it's, and so it's, I just got really connected to that. It was something that was growing up, my dad always used to talk about this family that he didn't know much about, because after all, he had a, his mother and three kids. Um, she would have, you know, probably gone and lived with her in-laws, I mean, her, her own family. So I started doing research on this, found this cousin who had done all this incredible research and it's going all the way back. And I had some stuff from my dad, and my dad died, he had these papers, and I started working, and I found this cousin who worked, I think, here at the Library of Virginia, and did a lot of the research on it. And, you know, then you see that, your documents, you said, you go out to Dinwiddie, I went out to Amelia County, to the courthouse, pulled a, a great big book out, deeds, open it up, look at it, put your name there, what property they own. It's in the one, to me. So this is about, in part, this book is partly about that unsettling. But I'm going to read a piece of prose um, that I wrote about it. Um, my last name, Boisseau, is French, but those people who look, this is your water. Okay, that's your water. This is my water. It's all on YouTube. <laughs> But my generosity will be in trying for it. I'll say, hey, hey, I'll go. Anyway, um, while I was working on this book, my oldest brother died. He was a, um, a schizophrenic and um, had respiratory 
disease. And as a matter of fact, I came back, I left here, Gray, it was like on a Saturday morning, I left, I saw you on Friday, Thursday, got back, he was in the hospital. So he died very quickly after I got home. So all this came linked up in my mind together because as a poet, and most poets are, we're pretty sick and weird things get twisted in our brains together. <coughs> So, this is Fitzpatrick Boisseau, Fitzpatrick Balso, Fitzpatrick Basso, Fitzpatrick Barso, there's lots of ways to say it. <laughs> Odd name, yoked way back. It was the name of my good brother, Pat, the name of my talented fuck-up of a father, and of his father, born 38 days after his own father, John Fitzpatrick Boisseau. Died wounds, received fighting for the Confederacy. How quickly we crossed the border into slavery. Stepping over it is over the low wall around a grave plot or show garden. Soil gone acid from two centuries of ruinous tobacco farming. Old Virginia's cash crop became its slave nursery. The standard image of the deep south, ancient mansions, trees dribbling Spanish moss, doesn't suggest how new many of those plant plantations were when the Civil War broke out. As vividly as my generation recollects the riots and assassinations of the 1960s, the generation of Southern whites who sent their children to war in 1861 would have remembered their own journeys from the original slave states to new states like Alabama, Mississippi, Missouri, Texas, Walking alongside the loaded wagons were slaves, many of them children, plucked from their families. The Boisseaux and the families they married into the South were mostly minor planters and slaveholders. My Confederate great-grandfather was a son of Peter, Virginia's legislator, lawmaker when the Fugitive Slave Act passed, a son of Daniel, a teenager when the revolution broke out. Each man sported the name Fitzpatrick Boisseau, like a family cowlick or cancer. And over the next border we go to British citizens, to Daniel's mother, Anna Fitzpatrick, who married the grandson of the first Boisseaus in the Virginia colony. Our genes are tangles of tangles. We know only that Anna married twice, that's her name, A-N-N-E-R, married twice, had at least 10 children, lived and died in Virginia, wore dresses, drank from a cup, looked at the sky for rain. Literate or not, determined or lazy, open-hearted or emotional chip counter, troubled or smugly shrugging at the system. I know only that she and the whole pack of them, down to Jean Boisseau, who fled persecution in Montabon, France in 1685, and his wife, Sarah Holmes, whose family had been here already for a couple generations, sucking the riches out of the soil, and lived here at that cru crucial moment when the labor system moved from common indentured servitude to race-based matrilineal slavery, the likes of which hadn't been seen before. I know only that they lived as comfortably as they could while holding the wolf they dared not look in the eye, the solemn green eyes of their undoing. The artist Kara Walker says, as soon as you start telling the story of racism, you start reliving the story. You keep creating a monster that swallows you. When you hear the growls of what has fed us and our children, our minds get busy trying to drown out the sound. Couldn't help it, not my fault just the way it was back then. It's god-awful, but what's to be done? The commute's brutal, but the schools. Our brain seems wired to soothe our sins. My dead brother Pat spent 20 years on the warm side of brilliant, funny, kind, admirable, then 33 years wandering the woods of the Madlands, where devils hang like possums from branches, where Jesus is a volcano, and like a hank of hair, your soul is yanked from your body by a passing pickup truck 
while you talk on a payphone to your sister. In my sickest, most knotted, stinking, gothic, grief-stricken daydreams, which I sorrily confess are not that rare, I think this name is freighted, a curse out of Hawthorne, a canker, a festering, a ganglion grown inside the fault lines of self-justification, a 17th century snarl that twists in the switchwork of our genes and erupted as my brother's suffering. His was an indescribably, casually unjust, ruthless panorama of pain that answered nothing but echoes. So I'll read you a few poems from this long poem called The Re a Reckoning. And it has things in it like that are odd, like slave narrative wills, just chunks of stuff I pulled out. So one of the things I did, Greg, after I saw you, I went out to the property where they owned. And uh, I grew up in a family of nine kids, so um, we pretty much did whatever we wanted anytime we wanted to, you know, control nine children. <laughs> So, I mean, there's a fence. I, I climbed it. <laughs> there's another fence. I went under it. But then I got nervous because my rental car, car had New Hampshire plates. <laughs> so I thought, man, I don't know. <laughs> I want to be wandering around in the woods and New Hampshire plates, you know. But I, I, I went out, I was on there where their property was, but I couldn't find, I was trying to find where the, gra where the graves are because they would have been buried in the Civil War. Maybe the father died. Couldn't find them though. But I could see where, I mean, I found this place where I think where the house would have been. But it was just like a big, it's, it was here. It said, no trespassing violators will be prosecuted, etc. A road of industrial gravel staggers under the locked gate. I climb under the second gate. I swing underneath. Drizzle sticks like cotton lint to junk trees and scrub. And around the bend, a clear, clearing opening onto, nope, not the house where they lived. And around the bend, nope, no belilac cellar hole buzzing like a hornet's nest with ancient meaning. Nothing to weep over, no granite knees, even the rocks aren't local, trucked in, dumped. Instead, big as an airplane hangar, a garage for backhoes and spreaders turns up where the big house might have stood. How many cabins would have required would have been required for the three score people they held as slaves? This time next year, the trees will have been knocked aside like incidents, and driveways poured. I count my camera as the rain picks up, and video the new, the view they didn't have across the Appomattox smoke sputters from a single white trailer, thumbtack stuck in a tree. They're. Uh, you know, that, well, Chesterfield County's just become a big suburb of Richmond, right? Just like, and so back, and they, even where they lived, and back, and you go back over, and you go over that, and the of river, and there's the suburbs are just starting, you know, just creeping up, you can see them. And all this history's right underneath everywhere, you know? So my grandmother lived like, maybe like this, in, this, in a house in this block, you know? But she's a great grandmother, but she, you know, the buildings aren't here anymore. Of course, a lot of things were burned by the Confederacy retreating, you know, too. <laughs> and they were blowing up the Richmond. Anyway, so here's a... Field Guide to North American Guilt. The idea of um, a Sunday in God here is is that all, all of human history just happened while God was asleep, pretty much, rolled over in an instant. When you, when you compare human time to geologic time, it's so immense. And it's, for me anyway, great solace to know the rocks are here. And they're, you know, they're here. They've been here. So, field guide to North American guilt. There isn't any way you can deal with this, frankly, you know, with this history. How do you deal with it? You just can't. It's just too huge. So, outcroppings of the oldest forms have weathered into mountain stubs, blunt incisors of a blind dog, the 
household skirts around. The worn hill spills its gravel, which is chewed and smoothed in riverbeds, and sported along burrs on the fur of currents, and with silt, shells, bugs, tracks, and spume laid in oceans, impressed with time, scarred, or driven deep under to boil, and sometimes, rarely, it is tamed, expressed like rubies from feldspar, the clear crimson crystal of shame. Before the age of aerial bombardment, so I have a copy of the map, battle map that was used in Battle Cedar Creek where my um, great grandfather was shot. It's really weird looking at these old contour maps, all the writing in them, and you're sort of like, you know, how a map is, you stare at a map long enough, you feel like you're flying. You know, you're like, you're, you're like, where's your perch? You're way up, you look at it, you look at a map long enough, and you begin to sort of like, things begin to materialize. So this is sort of about this, this um, situation, or looking at this map. Shenandoah Valley, October 1864. Detail, abstraction, creation. In the flying dream, I glide above the scorch and guns, brooding over the field as I form the world from an old battle map. Burnt Mill, J. Howell, Schoolhouse, Widow Stickley, Rosser, 11 p.m. A river swivels inside the tighter squiggles of contour lines. Arrows and pinpoints quicken farmstead and depot, commander and camp, chimney stump. I perch a moment at 4 a.m. where the squashed buttery moon glints off his buttons, or his horse clicks a rock at Cup's Ford, and it is time for my Confederate great-grandfather to get gut shot and waste away, linger three years, the wound still separating then leave his widow with a child who has one child. Therefore, writhing reckoner, I ride this map like a flying carpet and start the world for them to end again. So I decided that, uh, I'll just read two more poems. I decided that I needed to give this person, Gibson, who ran away, he's like the one person, I had the names of some of these people, Little Suey, you know, just, where have, where did they, what happened to him, you know? This guy, he ran away in 1834. I don't know if he got away. I mean, ran away from um, Chesterfield, Chesterfield County, ran away to the slave notice, you know, put in the paper, put in, ironically, put in the paper, it's published, put in the paper on July 4th. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he got away, probably not. Probably not. But, you know, I like to imagine, you know, what might have happened. He could get away and all you know. Probably not. Probably got captured. Probably got hurt. He'd have to live 30 more years before he would be legally free. Anyway, this young man runs away. So this is this guy, Gibson. I decided I should let him talk. And so he's talking to me. Though you try to puppet me, what happened to me is not for you to know. You know it was a Sunday night I fled. You know, or so says the U.S. Naval Observatory's website, the moon, a waning crescent, rose after midnight and civil twilight ended at 8.06. You can lie on the floor and try macro imagining me from drained swamps, capital dome, stacked stones, orchards. My far stretched hand even moves your first spoonful of peaches. In micro-imagining me, the stench of fear, summer woods, hunger, slapping vines, hard moons on my shoeless feet, the bite of roots that I steal away on the long wire of longing, which hooks itself one end to your gut, hooks the other end to lover, brother, father, open ocean, longing you know. Seven generations you know of, engendering generations. Do the math. This is um, some of my research turned up this photograph. 
and, and the WPA photograph. It's amazing stuff you can find. <laughs> this is a house. There's a farm, um, the Museum of the Civil War Soldier, of the, and it's on the property that um, some of my um, relatives had down south, down south of uh, Petersburg. But this is a different house. Leafless trees. Um, it, it, this is, you know, this part of the country is overrun with old houses. Um, and you know what happens oftentimes. There's, people can't fix them up. And so um, they turn into barns. Um, and then eventually they end up disappearing. So it's just getting more and more beat up. So this was a very bad looking house in the 1930s. It was quite a bit nice at one time, but this was a mess. Leafless tree shadow scribbles the walls, and shadows of deflated bushes flood the yard. An arrogant silver squalor, so pitted and clumped, it seems a crowd had barged about, then despaired of raising a response from such a blank and pointless house. Bare weatherboard of equivocal color, snaggle tooth shutters, the place couldn't look better for how bad it looks. Mythic, Faulknerian, with a satisfying smack of the cartoon, a place you discover a goat enjoying the taste of mantle. Shirts tugged from an off-stage clothesline and flung beside the swayback steps turn out to be chickens, a couple strutting roosters, and a low, lone pea hen. Someone has been working here, patching the roof, carrying it off. A long, glaring ladder meets tweezers-like its crisp, leaning shadow. The two long legs of a huge being who's about to stride over the fields and trees, over the excellent fires made when old wood starts to burn. Thank you. Now we're supposed to take questions, make more comments, talk about writing, where it comes from. If you cannot be a poet, it's a good idea to try to write something else. But if you can't help it, and you got to write poems, that's what you got to do. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> yes, it's the hardest thing to do, so you just can't stop doing it. It's nuts. Because no one will ever pay you a dime. <laughs> well, they might pay you a dime. It doesn't be working. Yeah. Well. Okay. <laughs> it's hard. I, as I tell my students, it's excruciating fun. I have a question, um, and this one's for Michelle. I was intrigued by the fact that you said that you had My family, like most families, you know, they don't think about it. I think about it. I feel horrible about it. But I don't I don't know if I can deal with it, you know what I mean? It's just huge. It's like, that's why I think I had to think about it in terms of geologic time. I had to think about it in terms of rocks, you know, in order to deal with it. I and mean, that's what the whole idea is, like, it's so huge. And it is, it's not, you know, it's not just, you know, what happened in the United States. It's happening now. You know, um, I mean, there are, it's, it's, uh, and what people do to each other is just amazing. It's just amazing. They do great things for each other, too. I mean, I have my family trees in here, and I have my mother's side of the family, too. I mean, you know, there were, there were, even on my side of the family, I mean, there were people who did set their um, slaves free, you know, and they did do that, my even, but there were others who didn't, you know. And I think, you know, the, the, the course of what happened in the 19th century is really interesting. You know, it's just like the history that no one ever reads and what happened in the first part of the century and the fighting over it. It was not, and it went on for years, you know. There's a lot of things. And people didn't 
really, they were stuck in a sense. People were stuck in this system and they couldn't think their way out of it. And it's still, I mean, we still are suffering from it. You know, this country, what's the problem with the public schools in this country? You know, it's just, we're still suffering from this, you know? It's everywhere. We, you know, and it's, I don't think people talk about it. They can't, it's like too big, you know? So hopefully with, you know, our man in the White House, maybe, but I don't think so. It's, um, maybe, it's, I think my daughter's generation, I think this might be slightly better, I don't know. But you know, what happens to people who are young? They get middle-aged and get more conservative. <laughs> As I say, you know, there aren't many revolutionary mortgages. <laughs> so, I don't know if that's answering your question, but I, I mean, I don't, I, I, what can I say, you know, what can I say? You know, I grew up, you know, here's the obituary, my grandmother's, great-grandmother's obituary, and it's pasted inside of a, a book of poems, long published poems. You know, my family got to read, right? They were long-time readers. They were educated. I passed that down to me, you know? You, you didn't, I mean, there was a time in, in the Virginia in the 70s where you didn't even have public schools, right? There's insane times. There's some insane, insane things that happen in this country. It's insane. We're insane. It's driven us crazy, I think. It's driven me crazy. You know, I, you know, I, you know it's called, you know, writhing. Writhing reckoner is what I call myself. Yeah. And, it's, you know, it's not, it's not just my family. It's, you know, it's not just, and it's not even just the Southerners, you know? It's, and, you know, England had a lot to do with it. You know? France had a lot to do with it. Certain kinds of Nigerian um, kings had a lot to do with it. You know, I mean, and this still it goes on. You know, there's class and people, you know, St. Patrick himself was a slave. You know, I mean, there was slavery, you know, the word slavery, the word slavery, the word that they used in, they used in Rome was service, serve. That's where we get the word service. The word slavery was because it came from slavs. They were the last people to be Christianized. And you could enslave those Polacks. That's where we got it, ended up with the Slavs. So, I mean, this is human history. We seem to want to, you know, make people do work for us. <laughs> but the natural lineal slavery that, that got invented in, in here, in this country, is that's where the real horror is. You would have your own children, you know. It's your own child you sell away. I mean, that's just insane. What the hell? But, so, I mean, who wants to read a book of poems that are preachy and make people feel bad? So, I mean, how could I deal with that? I had to invent something to talk about. <laughs> Obviously, I have a, um, I mean, if nobody wants to read a book that just makes you feel guilty and sick, you know, so, I mean, and what good does that do? You know, so, I think about geology. <laughs> think about it in terms of geology. <laughs> between aesthetics and politics is the following. I think that the purpose of art is to make people more ethical. I think that the, the fact that a culture enshrines uh, the humanities in institutions like libraries and literary magazines is a testament to the fact that over long periods of history, people have understood that that's where culture lives. You know, Alexander the Great's library, um, Think about the, the, I mean, the, the Book of Kells was kept for safekeeping in a library, right? Um, if we think about politics as that which is done by a body politic, a polis, then 
politics is not so much the, the, the transitory question of who has power at any one time. What does a group of people believe? Politics is how a culture articulates its values. It seems to me that the connection between politics and aesthetics is that uh, as a culture, a large group of people articulate its value through politics over the long term. Think of that as a film. Uh, what you get, I think, with art and with writing is stills, snapshots, many of which are outtakes of, from that film. You know, I mean, the, it seems to me that all writer, writers and artists are sort of contributing to a large and long conversation that none of us actually get to hear the end of because you're either writing for posterity or you're writing to please some editor somewhere. And if you're doing the latter, that's, you know, pretty dull. And if you're doing the former, you never get to know whether you're successful or not. So people who are, you know, writing the hard stuff, and, and frankly, it seems to me that this book is an extraordinary testament to a historical moment at which people can and will and must ask, what does it mean? that I stand in this historical tradition, in this place, in this time, you know, how do I reckon with that which is problematic? How do I deal with, you know, an irreconcilable um, monstrosity? How do we all wake up in the morning and, and, and go through life thinking everything's normal when it isn't? You know, it seems to me that one of the ways that we do that is by making political agreements talk about peace, freedoms, if you can't hear my personal safety, you know? And another way that we, we are, manage that, that issue is by saying, all right, the world doesn't make any sense. It's in awful shape. It's probably going to get worse. And we have to behave as though that isn't so. How do we do that? We make something that's not here already. I think that all art is subversive. I think that all art, all writing, all acts of creating something that doesn't exist already, say, you know, the world is not enough as it is. I have to chip something in. And that is a, a statement, uh, sort of an individual assertion of power. And I think that those accrue into something that looks like politics. Why do we think that most writers and artists and intellectuals in the 20th century in America have been politically liberal? It's a reaction against political conservatism. I mean, for me, that's, that's the kind of connection you start seeing. Why do people think the way they do? What do they do with their beliefs? And it adds into, it's a sort of an individual expression of, of as I said, of cultural inheritance that, that you know, we know through what we call history. Most of when we say history, we mean politics, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's why we have an English department and a history department. Right. Right. As though the two things aren't related. Right. Well, that's bizarre. <laughs> you know, and that's a ridiculous construct. Mm -hmm. The idea that you can imagine history without understanding the literature, that you could study the literature of culture without trying to understand what was happening historically at the time that the thing was written. That's, for me, that's the connection. I hope that did it justice. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. I think, Michelle, uh, in your book, one of the, uh, it would have, I, Walt Stevens is much on my mind these days, uh, and uh, I know that he said uh, a change of style is a change of subject. And uh, inherent in that idea has something is something that's related to your book, because it seems to me that, uh, and I wanted you to comment on this, that you use some strategies to deal with the impossible materials you were working with, and that perhaps one of them was uh, engaging in a multiplicity of perspectives. Yeah, um, well, one thing is I, you know, you're looking at these, you're reading lots of books on, about race and slavery and so on and stuff like that. And, um, you know, where was I, 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 I was working on this stuff for a long time. It was part of my last book, and I pulled it all out and said, this does not work there. I have to reconsider everything. So I sort of started all over, and I just started thinking about it. Um, and so I just, like, just keep trying to change it. 
you know, and I also really felt that, I mean, I, I just really felt that I had to make everything um, right, you know. It couldn't, I couldn't do anything like, because I'm writing about this subject, you know what I mean, like, you know, do anything, anything cheap, you know, that was easy. You know, I had to like, I'm gonna talk about this, I really gotta talk about this, you know, and not just make it, you know, like, blah, blah, blah. You know, that my, my first go through, when I was first worked on, I had this long poem, and I, I talked about Italy, I all this other stuff, you know. The, I, the problem that I had is this interesting thing is that there's this relationship that I believe poetry needs to be beautiful. So how do you write about something ugly, beautifully? <laughs> is that wrong? You know, is that wrong to do that? And I just, you know, you know, and the thing that made me feel like I could do it was I just kept thinking about Carnegie Libraries. <laughs> you know, and having a beautiful library, neighborhood library that I went to as a kid, really kind of like made me feel just to have that beautiful library to go to when I was a kid, you know. And Carnegie himself is just a horrible son of a bitch, you know. And there's so many things like this, you know, like he's a horrible person, you know, and that he, that these libraries, I had like, there's almost like something happens that transforms. Beauty sort of like pulls itself away from its horrible roots in some way. And so that's kind of like, the way I could, could you know, I, that's what I had to justify. I kept thinking about Carnegie Libraries. And just the weird irony of that, you know, and it's not just the for only thing. I thought about the Medici's, you know. I mean, Florence is like my favorite place in the whole world, and it's amazing, and it's beautiful, and it came from horrible people. <laughs> A lot of it. I mean, horrible people. I mean, they burnt, you know, and, th and they, get, they went nuts themselves. They had Savonarola. They were throwing paintings on a fire, I mean masterpieces. Because they went nuts too for a while, crazy Savonarola. And then they, you know, after a while they went around and they got Savonarola and threw him on the fire, you know. So, I mean, people have done, you know, history is very comforting and geology, I find, you know. You look way back and you see, this is not the first time this has happened, you know. Civilizations die, civilizations rise, you know. They, you know, yeah. I just want to make the point that no one writes down good news, generally. <laughs> yeah. So the, the bad stuff makes it in print. And right. uh, I wonder also, just flipping through your book, it seems to me that a lot of the pleasure in it, and a lot of what gives it permission to be beautiful, is that it's incredibly authentic. And there's a lot of, <clears throat> to push your geology metaphor, there's a lot of fossils in there. There's a lot of wills. I saw the two wills in, yeah. in sort of similar hands. Yeah. It seems the publisher did a good job with that. Yeah. And that's uh, something to that. Well, I just heard sort of put it, I mean, I was like, how can I write about that? I'm just going to put the whole thing in there. <laughs> just put them in there. They'll speak for themselves, you know? It's pretty horrible when they're saying, you know, I give my bedstead, and then I'm give this little suey goes to her, and little, you know, it's like, you know, and this is what they did. This is the wills. They, they record them, and, and they're in this library, you know? <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just freaky, you know, this freaky, and everybody, this is the heritage. And it's not, you don't have to be a Southerner to have this, you know, be part of your, at the same time, my mother's family, they were a bunch of Presbyterians in Ohio. Those were abolitionists, you know, but that didn't get written down either, a lot of those people did. Because it, it was like, you know, you're, the, you're running from the Gestapo. You don't write down what you're doing. You don't write it down. And then most of it's lost. A lot of it's lost. Because people didn't talk about it, and then they didn't want, after the war, people were moving on. They didn't want to talk about it. And all that stuff just disappeared with people who did do things on both sides, who took effort, and then, you know, people don't want to hear, I don't want to talk to grandma, she's, I don't want to make any sense to me, and then it's lost. The whole history's lost really quickly. Except for libraries like this one. Any other questions? If not, round of applause, please.
out there. And so it was a poet himself and very, very much believed in the beauty of poetry. And I think that he would be very pleased with the work that you produce uh, and your work. And so keep doing it. Um, with that, I'm going to bring it to a close. Um, I will remind everyone that we do have a couple of other installments <coughs> in our Poe Book Talk series on um, Friday, October the 16th. Uh, Steve Barry, very prominent uh, mystery writer, will be uh, not here, but over at the historic Miller Rose Hotel being interviewed by Catherine Neville at noon. <coughs> And then on uh, the end of next month, on the 27th of October, Derek Nikitas will be here from Atlanta. He was actually a finalist for the Edgar Allan uh, Poe Award that was given each year, is given each year by the Mystery Writers of America, and he will be here talking about his new book, uh, Long Division, which uh, he's an incredible writer. We're very excited about having him here. All right, uh, what we usually do at the end of the program um, is to, in order to thank all of you for being with us this evening, is have a drawing uh, to win a copy of the book. Tonight's a little special because we have two uh, books to give away, so I'll ask each, uh, John and Michelle, to stick their hand in the box and pull, pull up the name of the Thank you for coming to the library in Virginia and come back soon.